Hey, Firebase developers. Uh, my name is Doug Stevenson. I'm a developer advocate with the Firebase team. Thank you for tuning in to Meet Firebase. And uh, we've come off pretty fresh from the Firebase Summit in Amsterdam. A lot of great product announcements there, and I'm super excited to have one person who worked very hard on one of the new releases. His name is John Burge. John, Hello. thanks for uh, joining me on the show. Yeah, thank you. So what was your big announcement from the Firebase Summit? So our announcement was for a product called Firebase Predictions which is a tool that allows developers to kind of understand what users are doing in their apps so that they can kind of custom tailor the experience in their app for those users. For instance, if a user is about to churn out of your app, you might want to treat them a little bit differently, maybe entice them to stay, give them a special offer, something like that. Okay. Something that you couldn't necessarily do to everybody, but you might want to do to, to you know, just the people that are going to leave so you can try to keep them around a little bit longer. So you have a way to target these users who you think who the, the product thinks is, are about to leave the app. So you could use Firebase Cloud Messaging or something yeah. like that to send a notification. Yeah one, of the, yeah, one of the great things about Firebase is that you know, we're just a small part of it. There's a lot of other tools, Firebase Remote Config and Firebase Notifications kind of being the, the two most important for this. But you can take our predictions that we make in Firebase predictions and then target people with Remote Config to tailor the use of your, of your app in a particular way. I see. Yeah. I so see. it's deeply integrated with the other kind of Firebase kind of tools, which is which is what's really so great about Firebase. So with Remote Config, you can change the look and feel and behavior of mm -hmm. your app to suit this, this special segment. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you could, you could change your app arbitrarily. You know, if you had a game where you killed zombies, for instance, you could make zombies 10 times harder to kill for some set of population if you wanted to. Yeah, um, yeah. Users might not like that. <laughs> they might not. Particular, but well, I, had a, I actually had a talk at the Firebase Summit about how to use um, uh, remote config in your games, and you can yeah. sort of like tweak some of the physics in some cases, yeah. right? And it's, that can have uh, interesting results, right? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so you have to definitely practice on development, not on your users, yeah. unless you un unless you're really risky. Um, unless you're, yeah. But I'll ask you a little bit more about predictions in a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But first, I think there's one thing you love to talk about, maybe even more than work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's that? Well, there's lots of things I like <laughs> to talk about more than work, I think. Um, but I think one of the things that's kind of kept my interest like my entire life is, is I've always really been an avid gamer. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of doesn't matter what kind of games you're talking about. It could be board games, computer games, sports. I played volleyball. I still play volleyball. Um, pretty regularly. Um, so I, I, there's just something about solving the puzzles that, that exist inside of games that I find very appealing. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been a gamer my entire life. Um, you, grew, you grew up playing games, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. When I was a little kid, you know, uh, and I'd be sick at school and, and I'd go to my grandparents' house. My grandparents had one of those old Ataris with the little plastic kind of joysticks. And I would just love playing on on that that Atari, and I would play games all the time when I was over there. And yeah, well, that's there, what I did too. So I had Atari yeah. Twenty Six Hundred. That's that's this that's, controller. That's, on yep, my yep. Shirt, everyone so. that has played yeah, on everyone that knows I'm a retro it. gamer because I have the shirt. That's how you know yeah. that I am into retro. Games. I, I can still feel that joystick There's in my the, hand. It has it, a particular it, like the, a little the, the way that plastic. it squeaks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's definitely yeah. good times. <laughs> Another hobby of yours that I know mm -hmm. uh, is painting. So I'm curious how you got into that. So painting, I got into really recently, actually. Um, maybe about a year ago or so, we had an offsite. So, you know, teams here at Google like to go on offsites together as like team building events, and you know, they're a lot of fun. This was up to, to Lake Tahoe, and um, there was a host of activities that you could do, maybe ten different activities, and one of them was painting. And I'd never really painted before, um, but I said, yeah, I'll give this a try. We went and painted, and I painted some mountains and a little lake, and I, I had kind of lucked into getting the shading right on one of the mountains, and it, and it kind of popped. It kind of looked like it was in 3D, like it was this real kind of thing. So you think it was luck. You, th you say it was luck. It was luck. Well, <laughs> it was luck, because I, I, the, the instructor that was telling us how to paint everything wasn't telling us to do this. I'd, just, you know, I'd seen kind of the Bob Ross mm -hmm. videos before and other videos of people painting, and, and I was a little bored, so I kind of mixed. I had blue, and I mixed a little white into it, and I made a little light area, and I had black, and I mixed it into the blue to make a dark area, and it worked. And I didn't know what I was doing, but um, but the fact that it looked kind of real to me uh, really kind of blew me away. And then months went by after so that. We actually have that picture here. Yeah. If you, if you want to show us that. So yeah. So this was uh, this is your first one, right? Yeah. This was my first kind of painting that I did, and you can see that it, it's not like it's going to be you know like a Picasso quality anytime soon. But it was this actual mountain here on this side, where I kind of had like the edge of the mountain kind of curve and. It just looked, it looked real, it looked better than the other mountains that I had done. 
And I mean, my bridge, I mean, my little, uh, my little thing here looks horrible. Of course, the perspective's all wrong and my clouds look like these floating cotton balls. But this, this painting was enough to kind of say, hey, wow, this is something that I could do. And if I practiced, I could, I could actually get better at it. Right, so you got hooked yeah. and you have, we have like others uh, yeah. of yours that you've done more recently. So this is like an acrylic one that I did. And I, I was just following along with Bob Ross. Um, I, I really, I'm, he's the guy who does all the happy stuff, right? He's, he's the, the one with happy cake. little trees and stuff. <laughs> gotcha. the, the, the guy's amazing. But the technique that he came up with, and I, and I think his predecessors came up with, uh, really allows you in a short amount of time to create a painting that's actually pretty reasonable. This was me tr before I realized he used oil paints. I thought he used acrylics like all beginners tend to. This was an acrylic painting that I did. And you can see that it's gotten a little bit better from my last one, but I think we have, have well, yeah, why don't yeah. we just go to this one right here. This right here is what I consider one of my best. It's one of my most recent. And you can see here, I'll hold up, um, I'll hold up my original one at the same time. And you can see the, the difference in, in my abilities. Oh yeah. Uh, so it's really, it's really pretty exciting to go from something like this in a relatively short amount of time to something like this. I really like this You can hang this one up, like that's I could, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one, one interesting thing is, I don't know how well it shows in the cameras, but the, the grass and stuff here is kind of blue. It was oh, supposed yeah. to be silver, but I, I don't really know how to mix colors very well. And as I was painting the grass that was supposed to be kind of like covered in snow a little bit, it came out blue. And I ended up really liking it, and it felt like I was like painting an alien planet. I was going to say like a fantasy like landscape. Yeah, or something yeah, like exactly. That. Mm. And this um, is—we have one more. This is your most more. recent one. This was oh, it's actually the one that I just showed oh, is my that, most recent. That, this okay. was this was my second most recent one. And some people say that this one is their favorite of the ones that I've done. The setting is actually really quite nice in this one. It's got a good balance to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a computer scientist and a software engineer, and you know, I have background in machine learning. And and, and a lot of the things that you do as an engineer and a researcher are. are following these rules to create something. Painting has a really strong similarity to that. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> some people, of course, are gonna have a natural gift for this, but painting, this is just rules. You know, oil paints, you just follow a set of rules to, to, to have a desired outcome. And I mm. wish I would have uh, appreciated this more when I was younger. I'd be much further along in my ability to, to paint. Mm -hmm. But yeah, super excited about painting. I try to paint something every week if I can. And there's more connections between art and computer science. Well, art and uh, programming that goes into games, right? Do you yes. think that there's art in games? Yeah, well, I absolutely consider games to be an art form. Oh. You know, back when, when I played games as, as a teenager and even younger, I think I, I got my first computer when I was around 10. That was just a ridiculous Timex and Claire thing with a memory keyboard. But back then, it wasn't cool to play games, right? All of the cool kids weren't playing games. No, they this, weren't. Is, this isn't something that you did, so you got a whole bunch of girlfriends at school. No, for instance, definitely right? not. Yeah, it didn't make you popular. It was right underneath, maybe you know, like a speech and debate team and chess club or something like that. Right, right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I loved games back then, um, and it was clear that you know there's a lot of artistic work that goes into these games, a lot of you know music, and and clearly, I mean, people draw, and you know, there's a lot of art in the games themselves, but. I think the overall layout of the game itself is is an art form. I think that's more apparent to people nowadays, but it certainly wasn't 20 to 30 years ago. Yeah, your interest in art does have something to do with your interest in engineering, and you've yeah. done some things personally on that crossover. Maybe not making games, but making other things. Yeah, I have an eight-year-old daughter, and when she was born, so this was a while ago, eight years ago, I had some paternity leave. So I found this really cool guy who had done this project of using genetic algorithms to try to learn the placement of translucent polygons to, to, to look like famous paintings like the Mona Lisa or just pictures of Barack Obama or Star Trek characters. That's what I, I like to do it too. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine, you know, you like put like a purple triangle right here and like a little red square on top of it and maybe a circle over here. And if they're all kind of transparent and you tweak around the colors, you know, with about 40 or 50 polygons, you can make a pretty good representation of some image like the Mona Lisa. So I spent weeks on my paternity leave kind of developing this genetic algorithm that would tune these. Uh, so it would kind of estimate the photo, but not perfectly. You know, it would have like this kind of artistic touch to it because it's limited in what you can do. Right. But that was fascinating. I'm, I'm deeply interested in all of these efforts that exist about trying to use both machine learning and just software engineering in general to generate art. Google's done, you know, with TensorFlow has done an amazing amount of work in this, this area generating all these cool fractal images. 
Um, and, and they're doing it with music too. Yeah. It's really neat. ML's doing pretty much everything, which leads me to my next question. With Firebase predictions, I'm kind of curious to know how it works. I know there's ML back there, but I'm wondering yeah. if you could tell me a little bit about how it knows when a user is about to churn or leave the app. Yeah, yeah, good question. So when a user is engaged with an app, you know, they're playing on their phone, pressing all these little buttons. Um, you know, not surprisingly, a whole bunch of, of little discrete events get triggered, and those events get sent ultimately to the Google to, to our Google servers. Mm -hmm. And then what my team does is it takes this kind of constant stream of events, and we get just trillions of events, just a tremendous number of them. Well, we organize all of these events chronologically for an individual user. And then so now for each user inside the app, we kind of have like this history of what, what events that they triggered. Mm -hmm. We then take all of these events, uh, we take a user, and that becomes a data point for us to learn a machine learning model. So we create these really large neural networks with TensorFlow, and these neural networks take all of the features, which are really just elements in the time series, and then associate those features with whether or not this user in the next kind of seven days is gonna churn or spend money or kind of trigger any event in, in the developer's app. Like a developer can make a prediction with our tool that will say, tell me if this user is likely to finish a tutorial or tell me if this user's likely to engage in a multiplayer app. I mean, it's, it's a really flexible tool. So um, it's kind of like experiments where you're sort of like setting up your hypothesis and figuring out if like that that's going to satisfy, that's going to be satisfied by whatever uh, the user's doing in your app. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it's amazing to me in a sense that we can really just throw all of this data at this enormous neural network and the power the, uh, of, of like TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is the, the underlying machinery here at Google for learning these really large, complicated uh, um, neural networks. Mm -hmm. And it just blows me away that we can throw our data at it and then it can learn these relationships between, like, like you know, there's some obvious relationships, like if you haven't logged into the game in the last four or five days, there's a really good chance that you're not gonna come back, right? It's not, it's not mm -hmm. guaranteed, and maybe in some games it's more guaranteed than others. TensorFlow figures all of this kind of stuff out. Mm -hmm. it, it's really an amazing platform and it's, it's you know, the, the phrase, standing on the shoulder of giants, that certainly happens <laughs> here at Google. Uh, I think a lot of people at Google end up leveraging just this immense power that we have here that if we weren't here at Google, we, we really just couldn't do these, these yeah. same kinds of and things. And we're, we're offering this at no cost, right? I mean, yes. So that seems pretty amazing to me. Like, it yes, seems like it we is. have all this computing yeah. power and you get to basically use it for free. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems kind of like amazing to me. <laughs> yeah, and from the outside world, I, you know, I think, you know, there's this kind of perception that it all just kind of works. I, I'm in the deep nitty gritty of it all, so it's like we'll get like a little alerts that trigger and little parts of our pipeline don't finish on time, and so we're scrambling around to make everything everything work. But sounds like engineering. Yeah, it, it's it's engineering, <laughs> and um, yeah, this is. So I've been here at Google for a while. I've been here for about ten years now. This this product, the Firebase Predictions product, is is certainly the most visible thing that I've done to the outside world. I, I was on the ads team for a long time, and so I would tweak around algorithms and how ads are placed, and no one would ever notice the difference, right? You know, we'd have some of our metrics on the back end go up by like two percent or a half a percent, which of course means a lot of money, um, depending on kind of the improvement that was made. But but this is the first time I've really shipped this like this kind of one this this product that's, that's just just highly visible unto itself, hmm. and and that's both really exciting. It's also pretty scary. Well, I'm so happy that Predictions found a, a home with Firebase. Yeah, and it's, you've been working on this for so long. Yeah, thank um, And you. I'm sure everyone who's watching at home also mm -hmm. will see some benefits as well. So yep, hope so. Uh, yep. Go out there, use Firebase Predictions. Uh, let us know if it's working for you. We definitely thrive on community feedback. So yeah. be sure to let us know how it's going and hope you get a lot out of it. So. Yeah, thanks so much. John, thanks for being on the show. You're very welcome. And thank you for tuning in to Meet Firebase. So if you want to see more great video content like this, be sure to tune in right here to the Firebase channel on YouTube. Uh, there will be more new episodes of Meet Firebase coming up, so be sure to stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.